If you bang your head, usually your skull absorbs the blow and protects your brain. But what if the blow comes again and again from deep inside your brain? I think neurodegenerative disease is that blow, and today it's slowly killing more than five million Americans. Whether the disease is Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, or Huntington's, each delivers its blow and then robs us of our memories, control of our bodies, our thought processes. Even our personalities. For one of those diseases, the source of the destruction is a single bad gene that destroys a walnut-sized part of your brain. I'm 46, around the age when it typically begins, and if I had that gene, that part of my brain might already be 50% gone. Yet I could still be standing here speaking to you as I am now. But in just a few years. More than 90% of that part would be destroyed, and I'd be rendered a writhing shell of what I am today: confused, irritable, and unable to communicate. George Huntington described this disease first in his patients in 1872. For six generations, those who had inherited this single bad gene suffered and died from it, and. During those 121 years, there was no progress and no answers. But then, in 1993, the single gene that causes Huntington's disease was finally identified and sequenced. I remember excitement reading the paper that March with members of the Laboratory of Human Genetics, where I was working. I was 22 and about to enter graduate school in neuroscience, and we were certain back then that a cure would soon follow. But in the generation since, I've watched an army of neuroscientists struggle to understand how that gene, and then other genes, doom people who have these neurodegenerative diseases. Institutes of Health and drug companies spent tens of billions of dollars to understand the link between these genes, their bad proteins, and the brain cells called neurons that get sick, die, and disappear. And yet today, there is still not one single medicine that can slow, stop, or reverse these diseases, devastating and invariably fatal. Neurodegeneration. It's almost unbelievable. We know the genetic code. We understand how proteins build and run cells for the most part, and yet, for a disease caused by a single gene, we have barely any answer for a family member who asks us, "What is happening to my dad or to my mom?" And when Nancy Freitz's 27-year-old son, Peter, an athlete, Was diagnosed with ALS. She was horrified to learn that there was nothing that could slow, stop, or reverse his progressive loss of motor control. So she started the worldwide ice bucket challenge. She wanted others to have more hope for a brighter future and for a better prognosis than Peter had received, and better than Lou Gehrig received. When he was diagnosed with ALS in 1939, or Woody Guthrie with Huntington's in 1952, Ronald Reagan with Alzheimer's in 1994, or Robin Williams with Parkinson's Lewy body disease in 2013, why is there no more hope today than there was back then? This is the question I've been asking myself since graduate school, and my conclusion is, we've been focused for too long on just the neuron. It's time we turn the brain and brain research on its head and look beyond the neuron, beyond its bad genes and their bad proteins, 
for a missing link in the system within which these genes, proteins, and neurons operate, the nervous system. I'm convinced the answer lies not just in showing how neurons can suffer from genetic disorders, but how genes can suffer from nervous disorders. So, let me show you how I think about the brain. It turns out neurons communicate in a kind of drum language. A neuron is electrical, and it generates a small fluctuation in voltage across its cellular skin that lasts a few milliseconds. But for this explanation, let's just call these fluctuations beats. A neuron beats at about 1 to 10 beats per second in idiosyncratic patterns. And on each beat, it reaches out with a tiny molecular drumstick, and it strikes another neuron's skin. These strikes use a small amount of energy, and crucially, no neuron can directly control any of the strikes that it receives. And the reason is that each neuron receives between 1,000 and 100,000 of these synapse connections, whose strikes come from other neurons and their beats all over the brain. The human brain is made up of about 100 billion neurons, so that's about one trillion new beats arising every second. And on each beat, each neuron reaches out not with one drumstick, but with thousands of drumsticks and strikes simultaneously thousands of other neurons all over the brain. That's potentially a quadrillion drumstick strikes happening across all the synapses of your brain every second. Now, with all this activity, what fascinates me the most is that the total amount of drumming in the brain, its total energy consumption, barely varies whether I'm vigorously speaking to you now or quietly chilling out afterwards. The system is beating away all the time at about the same global rate, which makes sense because a neuron's genes help to regulate its tempo. But what occurred to me next got me out of bed at 3 a.m. and set me pacing. You see, everything I've told you doesn't explain why, during the brain's resting state activity, neurons don't drum together, overwhelm each other, and sabotage the system. The brain has no drum master. And so we have to think of these genes not just inside a single neuron, but within the context of the entire nervous system. By sensing feedback from the brain, these genes don't just set the tempo, they implement a strategy. Like a frugal punk rock drummer, drumming on different heads in different places, gig after gig, night after night, so that he wears his drums evenly and his kit lasts a long time. A healthy brain must control its spatial patterns of drumming so that it doesn't wear out any one neuron, synapse, or gene in the system. Based on feedback from the brain onto neurons, synapses, and genes, neurons must learn to cooperate, to take turns and to drum evenly, like the hands of a good drummer. A healthy brain must drum evenly so that its trillions of synapses last a lifetime. To understand how these strategies for healthy drumming work, I decided to go back to basics and to go big. Because of the way the brain is constructed, drumming anywhere in the brain depends upon the whole brain. And so to understand feedback from the brain onto genes and how these strategies succeed and fail, I created a radical brain model. I mapped the brain's core components, and I connected them together in a new and consistent way that I call the grand loop. I discovered that despite all its complexity, the brain can be rendered elemental. This core anatomical circuit goes back to the Cambrian explosion, to a common ancestor 540 million years ago. Why? Because 
It includes the core key structures that all brains have in common, and each of the structures which are attacked by its own neurodegenerative disease. I think that this core circuit holds the key to unlocking these strategies for even healthy drumming in the brain, and I implemented the model and simulated it with synapses that adjust themselves based on feedback. And my team members and I have observed that disturbances in these adjustments can lead to unusual patterns in the model's drumming. I believe that in the major neurodegenerative diseases, that disturbances such as these can lead the brain to drum unevenly, and that tissues can fail with horrible consequences. That's because in the brain, a bad gene. An injury or aging can lead to changes in the circuit that create, then reinforce, subtle drumming habits, which are bad for the brain's structures. These bad brain habits, I think, are so subtle that individuals don't perceive them, they don't choose them, and they can't control them, and doctors can't detect them until it's too late. But once these bad drumming habits emerge, neurons overwhelm each other, and feedback from all over the brain causes genes to be expressed differently. This turns the brain into a bad drummer, who tears through one location in the nervous system, killing specific neurons in a specific tissue in a gruesome and evil way, effectively by beating them to death, and then. When the demon drummer shifts and bad drumming begins wearing a hole in a new location on the same drum head of the same drum in the kit, what we can learn from this is that the drum in the kit, which is eventually and completely destroyed, tells us whether the drummer's name was Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, or Huntington's. So let me be clear. I think that the brain's core circuit can kill itself one neuron at a time. This is what we aim to demonstrate using the grand loop brain circuit model. And if I could go back to 1993 to the table where we discussed that paper, I'd say, before we can understand how genes cause imbalance in neurons, leading to their death, neuroscientists must understand how the brain's core circuit balances itself and how feedback. From the brain onto neurons, synapses, and genes, can push the system to the tipping point. Now, the exciting news is that we're beginning to make progress and to unravel these challenges in Huntington's disease. We are simulating the brain's resting state activity as well as risky bad brain habits in order to propose new ways to alleviate. The stresses on the brain and on its neurons. We want to learn how to detect these habits early and then break them with a new kind of medicine that will finally offer a treatment and even prevent these diseases and the havoc that they wreak in the lives of patients. Within the Grand Loops brain circuit model are missing links for each of the neurodegenerative diseases. My team is understanding how these feedback mechanisms can change the circuit, and we do this by pushing the model to the tipping point again and again, until we expose each of this circuit's secret bad habits. Our goal is for neuroscientists and geneticists alike to adopt a global brain context for their research. A Radical brain circuit model with a grand loop at its core that can spark an explosion of new knowledge and propel us to finally find ways to stop any of us, like Nancy Freitz and her son, or Woody Guthrie and Robin Williams, from having to suffer the ravages of any of these cruel diseases. Thank you.